this is a really important session. We now are moving to a panel discussion where we're um, asking the opinions of external experts just to reflect on what we've heard this morning. So what I'm going to do now is to hand over to our chair for this panel discussion, Professor Claudia Matza, who's going to take us through the next 30 minutes or so. And, and she will introduce you to the panelists. Thank you very much to the panelists for coming today. Okay. So yeah, thanks Ling and, and, and the consortium for having us today. I'm personally, of course, really attached to this project and it was great to see where we have gone uh, in, in the last couple of years, and the latest results this morning. But I would, and that's really what, where I would like to um, drag this conversation today with you uh, as well. And maybe we can start by asking the panelists to introduce themselves. If, if you, we can start from you, Jasmine. I am Jessie Lynn Dunn. I'm an assistant professor at Duke University in North Carolina in the US. Um, my lab is the Big Ideas Lab. It's uh, joined between biomedical engineering and biostatistics. Um, we are focused on the development of digital biomarkers, so very, very close with the work being done by Mobilized. Um, and it's exciting to see all the way from the statistical basics up to the implementation sciences. So, um, we have a, an open source software platform that's integrating a lot of different um, codes that are developed by a variety of initiatives like Mobilized. Um, that's the DBDP. Um, hopefully, a lot of the efforts that have gone into this study will be um, further distributed and disseminated through open sourcing, and, and that's one of the things that I'm excited to talk about today. Great. Thank you very much, and hello, everybody. Um, my name is Professor Sally Lam. I'm from the University of Exeter. Um, I'm a physiotherapist by original training, and hence I've had a lifelong interest in helping people to regain and restore their mobility. And um, you know, I, I'm firmly of the opinion that to be able to walk is a joy. Um, I'm also a statistician, and I've spent many, many years helping many people from different disciplines design clinical trials to think about things like the outcomes, and that's both in the regulatory sector and in the academic uh, kind of non-pharmaceutical and surgical sectors as well. So I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. Thank you. Paolo? Good morning. Uh, Paolo Bonato from Harvard Medical School. I'm an engineer in a clinical division of the school, and so an interesting experience uh, focusing on translational research. And I am Alda from the University of Aveiro. I am a physiotherapist by background, and I mainly work with chronic lung diseases, uh, and therefore, obviously, uh, on a person-centered research, mobility is one of the outcomes that we uh, work, assess, and train on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I would like to start let's following a little bit the order of what we've seen this morning. So starting from the technical aspects of, of what you heard. Uh, you heard in, from the presentations how much uh, challenges and hurdles we had to tackle both from a data collection point and a data processing and analysis point. And one of the things that I would like to ask uh, both Paolo and, and Jocelyn is to comment a little bit on what you think, uh, whether you think that the work that we have done could actually impact uh, the, in, in the broader sense, our community and where you see uh, the results that you have seen presented today really having uh, a potential use and adoption. So, Justin, you want to start? Um, yes, I, so I, I just want to say that, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here because um, one, one of the things that I have jotted down is dissemination, is how to get these results more broadly disseminated in the U.S. and beyond. Um, I think we are running into this issue again and again, talking with FDA regulators, talking with implementation scientists about how to move this technical work from the bench top to the bedside. Um, and I think you all have shown how to do it. So it is challenging, and I think that's one of the, the, the great takeaways from this initiative is that there's a lot of thought that goes into each piece from the design of the studies to the development of the digital biomarker to um, deciding what uh, digital biomarker is appropriate for which clinical populations. Um, and I think a lot of that is taken for granted in the US and, and probably beyond. 
Um, and, and so my hope is that we, uh, Paolo and I, and hopefully others in the room can, can bring this knowledge back um, to help foster funding for initiatives that can follow up on this, um, to foster more collaborations with folks that are doing this work here. Um, but overall, just the, the magnitude of the work that's gone into this, I think has been underappreciated in the past, and hopefully this shows going forward what's needed to, to bring success to digital biomarkers. So we need to shout more. That's yes, absolutely. <laughs> one of the suggestions. Uh, Paolo. So certainly um, remarkable work from a technical standpoint. So congratulations, Andrea, Claudia, the rest of the team. Uh, really fantastic work. Uh, the clinical applications, extremely interesting. But I was thinking as I was listening to the talks, and it's probably uh, Lynn's uh, thoughts as well, right? And so um, perhaps the best is actually really to come, right? And, and perhaps really what Mobilize T has done is to create a community that is going to enable really change in the medical field. And so this, I think, is quite remarkable. And in fact, I was looking at the clinical application and say, well, you know, uh, all the work that the technical team has done is going to allow, for instance, to follow patients longitudinally and truly personalize interventions, right? Because I, I love the plots to show correlations with stages and things of the nature. But what I think is that, yeah, you know, we have been keeping the type of talk, you know, to my co colleagues in neurology. And what they do at the end of the talk, it's a ah, congratulations, great paper, right? And so, but they're not going to say what I would like them to say, which is, I want to use this tomorrow with my patients. And that's what I think the technology is going to enable in the future. So really, really, congratulations, great work. So can I translate what you just said in, in, in the fact that we probably took our technology readiness level one step further? With the, with the work we did here, and we are now really ready for that adoption that we hope to see. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, you, you can think of it, you know, are we ready to deploy, right, et cetera, et cetera, but I, I feel like the richness here is that we have a group that's going to continue this work and evolve as the technology is going to evolve yeah. and integrate with other technologies. And again, I was thinking, I want to see these integrated with some of the work they were doing on the biology piece, right? Because when you do personalized interventions, you're not just interested in figuring out, yeah, I might got to get a motor impact on these individuals, but you want to know why you're not, so that you can actually adjust intervention accordingly, right? And so, and am, am I using just these as a metric? No, this is going to be integrated in a number of other things that we're going to monitor these patients, right? Are, is this going to replace, you, you, you know, my patient reported outcomes, not necessarily, but it's going to in be integrated with that, right? Am I going to use this technology to monitor that at all? No, perhaps I'm going to use what I, I noticed, Bjorn, right, this coffee is here in, in the room, right? I'm going to use radar light technology to monitor that. You know, it doesn't matter, right? The point is that I'm going to have a tool that's actually really important for me to be able to figure out what to do exactly with Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Smith and Mrs. Thompson when they come through the door, and I'm going to really make a difference in the way I'm treating them. That's, that's I think, what is the long-term impact of what you guys have done. And, and I guess this, Aldo Sally, takes me to, 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 to basically uh, hand it over to you in terms of, do you see this having an impact on, on, on the clinical context and on your, on, on the, your work with the patients? And well, I think we all have seen the potential here today. The, Congratulations to all, of course, that's in order. Um, I think the challenge that I would like to hear more about it, and I'm sure the data is out there, like Judith, we have seen today, um, it's very much related with, uh, we see in the papers that using all sorts of filters, cutoffs, non-wet times, so the, the technical stuff that is behind it really affects your clinical result. And I, uh, you know, I've seen all the amazing validation work that has done by the team, and I was wondering how do you manage uh, the slow walkers with the fast walkers? Are the settings different? Uh, is the outcome result different? Um, and that will obviously affect the clinical side of things. 
And the other aspect would be the clinical relevance. Are there any cutoffs now that we have the data? Uh, can we establish cutoffs to actually train what is trainable? to tailor our intervention. And I would raise these two questions that for me, listening by this morning would be really important for rehab. And I would love to hear more about it. Judith, thank you. That's <laughs> well, So this is in the plan. <laughs> uh, so at the, Clearly, the fast walkers versus the slow walkers is among the a priori defined subgroups for which we want to test everything, okay? So this, this will come. Then about the cutoffs, we, are, we want to be able to define minimal important differences. We will test uh, associations, but also shape of associations. So maybe we can define cutoffs, but uh, let's say we are not yet there because first we need to make sure that what we are using is measuring what we want it to use and then then we can think more about the uh, more clinical implementations let's say but first we need to make sure about the validity Sandy I don't know if you want to give us a little bit of your perspective from what you've heard this morning yeah, sure. Um, so, first of all, congratulations. Um, fantastic pieces of work um, and really well conducted, beautifully thorough. Um, I'm convinced that I should use one of these measures in each of my clinical trials now, so well done. Um, however, I do have a few thoughts. Um, my first thought is really related to the use of the measures in clinical trials. I think one thing that we do struggle with, and we struggle with with the regulators, and we struggle with you know, the funding bodies, is in the definition of a primary outcome measure. Now, what I can see is I can see application for a primary outcome measure here, which is fabulous, but there's 25 measures within that primary outcome measure, and that's not as helpful as it could be as we step forward. So I think just being able to coalesce around agreement at this stage of the evolution of the technologies which is that which of these parameters we can kind of suggest is the most suitable for a primary outcome. And if, you know, I've had a very quick look at the data as it's flicked over the um, slides as we've been talking, and the one that convinces me is walking duration. Um, you know, it kind of seems to be uniformly fit across everything. You'll know better whether that's true or not because I couldn't quite uh, encapsulate everything. Um, so certainly that, that was a thought that I had. I can see that there is in future going to be re real value to be able to um, discover more about signatures of uh, gait in different conditions and how that might help disease specific trials as well. Um, but we're, there's, it, 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 there's some progress towards that point here and then there's a little bit more to do. I think the walking bouts data is really interesting. Um, I couldn't be convinced during the presentations whether the, the stop was a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> and that's probably because it's a bit of a mixture of things. And therefore, I, as a clinical trialist, I wouldn't intuitively go to a measure that I wasn't entirely sure what it was conveying. So those were my thoughts on, on the measures so far. I do have a few other thoughts, but I'm going to just take a step back for a minute. Thank you. Lynn, you want to comment on this? No? <laughs> so, no, I, I mean, somehow this takes me to the next question, which is really like, what are the challenges that, that, that we still need to tackle to get to the next step? And I think the point you made uh, is absolutely valuable and is absolutely something that is in the plan, that of coming up with, with a reduced uh, meaningful set of measures and we, we know that when you start combining different metrics is when the, the picture gets a bit more blurred and, and that's not what the regulators like so we know that in, in that field and in that perspective that's where we need to move to, towards so uh, I, I would I would agree with with, with with that observation but again back back the ball back to you is like what, what other challenges do you see that in, in, in bringing this to the next level Please. Everybody. So I was wondering in a spec 
in the perspective of a patient and a caregiver, for example, we seem to be able now to monitor all this data, to um, know a lot from different areas, from different patients, different settings. That's great, but that's great for us as professionals. So what about the patient? Uh, what about the caregiver? So when you have all this data, what is providing? How can we simplify it to a point that the patient can understand, okay, I have here a red flag, or the caregiver can understand this is a red flag and I need to take my patient with me to see a doctor or to see the rehab or whatever. So I, I suppose, I'm sure you thought about it, but I, I really would like to see the other side of the story. And I guess you'll have to wait for the afternoon. That would be my exactly. answer to that question in the sense that has, that has been like, and yes, of course. Yeah, I, I uh, had a little bit of a thought also about just some of the framing of the, um, of the, of the project. What I see that um, the team have um, been measuring is walking. And I know that you started by defining mobility as walking, but there are many groups of patients who would consider themselves to be perfectly mobile and unable to walk. So wheelchair users, for example, will consider themselves to have mobility. And I just wonder, as you step forward into the next phases of implementation, you might just think a little bit about that, because what you don't want is a lot of resistance from patient groups who are in wheelchairs saying, this is, you know, this is terrible. I can't walk, but I can play basketball in my wheelchair. I'm perfectly mobile because I can get from place to place, the W Health WHO definition of um, mobility. So that did just strike me, actually, as, as we mm -hmm. started framing it. And I, I, didn't, I didn't know whether that was fair. I didn't know why, why you'd gone from mobility to walking, perhaps one of the you know, kind of just fuse the two without distinguishing any other forms of... So maybe I can start answering that and then I'll, I'll, I'll definitely call for help. <laughs> but the... So when we started the project, I mean, you know, this type of calls and this type of frameworks are very prescriptive. So we were given the task to measure walking. Yeah. So, <laughs> and that's what we did. But of course we realized that... that and, and in particular, we were given the task to measure walking speed. And we immediately realized that this is just one, one place to start. And I would, and, and of course we were targeting uh, specific um, stages of the different diseases where probably uh, wheelchair bounding was not in, 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 in the focus, in the scope of the project. Having said that, uh, I would agree with you that it's, I mean, be, uh, being able to perform activities of daily living on a wheelchair will still be considered as, 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 a, as an important stage in mobility, but it's, it was just simply not, not, not in, the, in, in, in this specific framework. But nothing would prevent the next person to develop an algorithm where you can use the same sensor while a person is on the wheelchair to try and, and measure other dimensions of their mobility, which is more related to uh, you know, they might even manage to go farther than someone that is not accepting to be on, on, on a wheelchair at that point, so their mobility might be even better, but that, that's really just a matter of, of what we were measuring at that stage. And I don't know if, if Clement or, or Lynn, if you want to add. Uh, I mean, and that's my naive technology, <laughs> technolo technology expert view, but... You're quite right, Sally. Mobility is one of those words, isn't it? It's so broad, um, and it's used and abused, it means different things to different people. Um, and that was a challenge for us really, we were trying to be comprehensive, um, but probably overly comprehensive. Uh, and and I, I accept that um, as an observation, in fact we've discussed it, we've all been discussing it recently, <laughs> uh, and, and identifying that we need to sort out our terminology. Um, I introduced a definition that we've used for, for mobilize, which is the ability to walk while carrying out activities of daily living. So we've identified walking as an important core concept mm -hmm. of mobility, but we're not measuring all, all concepts of mobility, obviously. Um, 
but I do think there's something important about framing that. And, and funnily enough, when I'm talking about mobilised, I'm always aware that I say we're talking about, you know, mobility is important. We are interested in this part. This is the bit of mobility that, that we're interested in. So, yes, there's some work to do to be careful. But I think, as Claudia has just said, with this one device we are able to quantify other aspects of mobility, and that's probably why we've tried to keep things as open as possible. Uh, but going forward, we need to be more precise so that people are clear about what it is, and then we can expand that later. I don't know if anyone else wants to. So I was, uh, one, um, are there questions from, from you as well? Like. For, for our panelists, those are more than welcome. So, so I, I, yeah. I just wanted to comment on challenges, yeah, Ryan. I think it's a mix of challenges and opportunities. I love Brian's presentation, Brian Coughlin's presentation, right? When you talk about this massive amount of data that you have collected. And it's, I, I trust many of us in the audience who would feel the pain. Um, <laughs> because collecting, annotating, curating large data sets is extremely painful. And it's very costly. I had a conversation with some of our colleagues at Google and discovered they spent half of their budget <laughs> um, creating some of these data sets because the annotation and curation was so expensive. Yeah. And the quality of what you can offer to the community is really a function of the quality of your annotation at the bottom line. And I would love to see this as an opportunity to um, run uh, data challenges, discover out of these data sets things that we haven't discovered yet. And many of us has run competition. Jeff Pausdorf, I think, is in the audience. Mm -hmm. Ran a few competitions. We ran a few uh, with Sage Bio Networks and the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Fabulous work that comes out of it. But the challenge is that how do we make that into an actual clinical application? And as you were talking about COPD, I was thinking, it's since 20 years back that we think of, can we use this technology to achieve early detection of exacerbation episodes? That would be a game changer. And there, is, there has been literature over time really uh, encouraging from that point of view. Nothing wrong in taking what you have done and integrating it with other measures. For instance, for that specific topic, I think it's key that you look at systemic responses. And we had a hypothesis with Dr. Moy a while back that what you should do is to look at bouts of activities and how systemic responses show actually deficiencies that are uh, developing over time. In Parkinson's, you know, with David Standard, we have done 20 years back. We have hypothesized that you can actually do a better job titrating their medications when you look at fluctuators, right? So I would love to see that in the clinic. So the challenge is, can you take the data that you have collected? Can you take the technology and methodologies that you have developed to actually truly address those points to the extent that my cardiopulmonary colleagues, my neurology colleagues, would say, okay, I'm going to use this to monitor my patients. No, and I think this is an excellent point. And also it's like what, what Brian, uh, hinted at during the presentation is how much work has gone into the real-time curation of this data. And I, I think that both in the TVS and it, so in the technical validation study and in the clinical validation study, that's been quite an obsessive mantra that we had in, in really making sure that this data would be of good quality, not just for us, but, but when they, they are shared. And I was very pleased to hear that, you know, all of this will be shared with the community. And I think that the idea of like these challenges and everything. Again, this is something that we had in mind when we started the project and COVID was a nice friend that was with us all the time. So all those hands-on hackathon and type of things that we had in mind, of course, were, uh, will have to be held uh, now in, uh, in a second time. But I, I, I entirely agree that this, this is just like opening the world to, to so many more, uh, many more ideas and many more pieces of work. Just okay. So, so I actually, I come from a genomics background and something that I think the genomics community has done incredibly well that our community has yet to do is, is really coalesce around <coughs> standards and standard pipelines and standard methods. And so one of the, the huge value adds of this study is that you've put such 
critical thought into what those data standards would be. There's a poster just on data standards. There's a poster just on the algorithm development. And I think making that reproducible, developing a framework around that such that it's, it's not every study and every group reinventing the wheel every time they take an accelerometer and put it on a person. Um, so that's maybe a call to action, if nothing else, to say, you've done the work, now making this adoptable um, and making others want to adopt it by making it easy to access is really important. So I hope that's one of the things that comes and, out of this. And again, I think that one of the things when we started the technical work around this and in the algorithms development selection, all that piece of work, we had a specific goal at that point was we need to do this in a very short time frame because then there will be the clinical validation study. So we really took out of the drawers all of our algorithms, some in MATLAB, some in Python, some in, and there's been a lot of work in, in, in patch, patching the different pieces together. The beauty now is that after that piece of work was done and we could start the clinical validation study with valid algorithms, now the team is working on implementing them in Python and make sure that the library will be shared and will be accessed to, to everyone. So there's been, again, a two-stage process that we had to go through, but I fully agree with you. Hopefully that's, the, that's really the, and I think also the work around the standard that has been not just in the, in the data, uh, in, but so all the methods that we have developed, all the protocols, from, from how we uh, tested the device down to how we work with the patients. The whole idea has always been to uh, share all those results, all those data, all those approaches, even, in, even earlier on in the project so that if someone was starting to follow us and to adopt our techniques, could do it from the beginning. So the data standard paper was published before we even started processing the data so that we could uh, prepare, let's say, the field for that. So I'm glad you mentioned it because I think it was quite an impactful piece of work. We have, I don't know if there are more. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I would agree with you. Um, big data, I think, has got quite a lot to uh, show and help with the analysis of this data. I think certainly exploration of latent variables would be useful, latent concepts that might underpin the variables might just help to compress. It, it's interesting to see so many correlated variables. I mean correlated within the DMOs, not, um, I hope I got that right, digital measurement outcomes, mobility outcomes. Yeah, um, they're correlated, you know, kind of within the device itself. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it, it, there should be some very interesting analytical techniques to use there. I wondered, uh, my question is actually a little bit different. One of the things that I also thought about um, as the data was being presented is that I, I agree completely, um, walking is an incredibly enabling uh, thing to be able to do, it enables you to do lots and lots of things, but it is a choice to walk, um, and I wondered how much you had spoken about the choice, because I'll give knee replacement or hip replacement as an example. I want to have a hip replacement so that if I choose to, I can go hiking. Now, I may never take that choice, or if I choose to, I may take a short bout of walking, but I may never choose to. But the reason I want the treatment is because I want the choice to be able to do it. Um, so how does that feed into, I mean, you must have kind of clocked this, is that it's really a difficult issue, actually, for outcomes in general, uh, these types of outcomes. Please. <laughs> Very early on, we had some, I'll uh, say, challenging discussions, for instance, like, as you were saying, um, when we planned the clinical trial, we originally planned for a home environment assessment and walkability of the neighborhood. And then we decided against it because of the burden um, of the assessment overall. Um, similar with that, as you said, we would have techniques of goal setting and prioritizing, but based on these three hours to three and a half hours we already had, we just could manage. It was a very painful exercise. I was very much in favor of environmental information and so on. So this is unfortunately something that we could not collect. I think Judith wanted to comment as so the, the choice would affect what we call here the walking activity DMOs, not that much the gait DMOs. And actually we have tested, and I think results are surprising to me, so parameters like cadence, 
the stability within a person is over 0.99, the intraclass correlation coefficient. No matter if you walk 20,000 steps or you walk 50 steps, the cadence is extremely stable within a person. So uh, this, uh, you are right, uh, we have not tested choice, but depending on which of these parameters, you may not need it because it's very stable within a person and it can give you some information on the disease. That's and a very, very important observation. <laughs> Maybe I can just. Uh, no, I'm, that okay. Yeah, and I. Th I think vitally important when you come to perhaps well, if you're going to think about primary outcomes, uh, that you just think that through. They're kind of more conceptual. Um, challenges than they are measurement challenges. You've got the capacity to measure, the capability of measuring both actually. So maybe I'd make my primary outcome cadence and not duration now. Thank you. <laughs> if, if I may Sorry. comment, perhaps this might be obvious to folks in the clinic, but let, let me, um, let me uh, say this using uh, gross categories, right? And so, capacity, performance, and quality of movement, right? Um, it's sometimes underestimated how important in the clinic it is actually to know the difference between capacity and performance. Um, an example, a learner using stroke, right? Um, so what, what that means is that if there is no motor practice in the field, uh, the motor abilities are going to be lost by these individuals due to remapping the cortical legs, right? So fundamental. It's not that I'm replacing capacity with performance. I want to know if there is a gap so I can actually work on it clinically. Mm. And in fact, we have behavioral interventions that we're deploying at the moment in which if there is capacity, but we don't see performance, behaviorally we actually encourage activity, <coughs> right? But if there is no capacity, there is no point pushing people beyond the limit. So we actually work on interventions that are based on capacity. And quality is also fundamental because if patients are using compensatory movement strategies in the field, they might show what we call their good gait during examination, but they don't in the field. That might That's actually the lead bad. to orthopedic issues, right? So for instance, Andrea simulated very poorly, <laughs> you, you know, um, circumduction in stroke, right? And so, but we certainly don't want, I'm just joking, right? So it did, it did very well, right? So, but we certainly don't want them to, to actually show a stiff gait pattern if they can actually get into an inflection. We don't want to get them to do vaulting. We don't want them to do circumduction in the field because we know that's going to cause problems to their joints over time. So, so that's actually knowledge that we can use clinically, mm -hmm. right? So, it's for more for the engineers than the clinicians. The clinicians know, right? So, <laughs> but it, it's to say those tools are actually really, really important in the clinic. So I think we have reached the uh, conclusion of this session, which unfortunately we have reached because I could go on forever, but before Lynn shuts me. <laughs> so thanks everyone, and thanks all uh, the panelists for, for your very inspiring thoughts, and have a nice lunch.